Hey there, it's Dr. Peebler again for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. We are going to finally finish up the conversation about HIF-1 in terms of its activation through processes called pseudohypoxia. I felt that it was important to out of completeness sake, mention these last couple of known factors. So a protein that we have not yet talked about is AMP kinase. And AMP kinase is our body's nutrient sensor. And when it's active, it is extremely beneficial. And when it's not active, it can be problematic, especially in cancer. So this article is saying that AMP kinase is a central regulator of energy homeostasis, which coordinates metabolic processes, metabolic pathways, and thus balances nutrient supply with energy demand. Because of the favorable physiological outcomes of AMP kinase activation on metabolism, AMP kinase has been considered to be an important therapeutic target for controlling human diseases, including metabolic syndrome and cancer. Thus, activators of AMP kinase may have potential as novel therapeutics for these diseases. In this review, we provide a comprehensive summary of both indirect and direct AMP kinase activators and their modes of action in relation to the structure of AMP kinase. So what we're seeing here on the right side is that when AMP is activated, it can, first of all, decrease several factors that are related to tumor proliferation and progression. It's going to decrease or cause negative feedback on anabolic growth pathways, and it's going to activate or have positive feedback on catabolic or breakdown products. Furthermore, when AMP kinase activity is low, it is going to stabilize HIF-1-alpha, which then promotes the Warburg phenomenon or Warburg effect. So low AMP kinase activation or activity is going to be associated with a pseudohypoxia. It's also going to lose control of this TSC2, which is going to activate the anabolic pathways mTOR, and we're going to have other downstream effects related to mitochondria, including lack of autophagy or mitophagy, which is the breakdown of mitochondria. We're going to lose the ability to produce new mitochondria through mitochondrial biogenesis. And that's going to have a negative influence on our ability to produce energy through oxidative phosphorylation. So the Warburg phenomenon characterized by the prevalence of aerobic glycolysis over minimal to no oxphos emerges as a predominant metabolic phenotype in cancer. And that's related to partially to a lack of AMP kinase activity. So you may be wondering to yourself, how does AMP kinase get activated? And how does AMP kinase get become underactive? And since it's a nutrient sensor, Whenever we are in a calorie surplus or overeating, we are going to have low AMP kinase activity, whereas the exact opposite effect is going to happen with a calorie-restricted diet, a ketogenic diet, or fasting. And then the last pathway that we know about is the declining NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide supply, which then leads to decreases in CERT1 activity, which then stabilizes HIF and causes another form of pseudohypoxic state, which then leads to possible progression to the Warburg effect and metabolic reprogramming of cancer cells. So what this is saying is that we trace the cause to an alternate PGC1 alpha beta independent pathway of of nuclear mitochondrial communication that is induced by a decline in nuclear NAD and the accumulation of HIF-1-alpha under normal oxygen conditions with parallels to Warburg reprogramming. So I hope that you're starting to see not only what the issues are that kind of lead to the metabolic reprogramming of cancer through the Warburg effect, it's the hypoxic or normoxic, pseudohypoxic activation of, or I should say stabilization of HIF-1-alpha, which then has all the downstream negative effects that converts a normal cell to a cancer cell, or at least a cancer metabolism phenotype, which can become out of control. Then once the cancer Warburg metabolism phenotype starts to produce a lot of lactate, obviously we know lactate is going to feed back onto HIF-1 and create the vicious cycle we know about. I hope also that I'm making the case that a calorie-restricted diet and intermittent fasting or prolonged fasting can be powerful allies to you on your cancer journey and your health journey in general. That's exactly why Dr. Seafried always talks about a calorie-restricted therapeutic or medically ketogenic diet as being a very powerful kind of baseline state you need to be in in order to have success for metabolic therapies to work. I can't underscore the importance that intermittent fasting can have on your health, including a lot of other disease problems processes, but especially for cancer. If you like these videos, please like, share, and subscribe, and get them out to people who need this information, people who have cancer, people you know, people you love, because this information can be absolutely life-saving. Until next time.